We invite you to contribute to the chat box on the right and tell us where you're from. If you have any questions during the show, please add them to the questions button below. I'll try to get to as many as I can. On today's episode, we're talking to three filmmakers who ask tough questions about race. Many of us are asking similar questions of our institutions and of ourselves. Certainly at Doc NYC, we're going through our own self-scrutiny. As a New York festival, we've always strived to reflect the city's diversity in our team, in our lineup of films, and in our audience. But we know that we can do better. As the artistic director, I'm thinking hard about my own unconscious biases and trying to vigorously engage with different perspectives. We will be working hard in the coming months to make our November festival the most inclusive edition yet. While we work on long range planning, in the short term, we wanna highlight other organizations and initiatives that we admire. And I'm gonna uh, mention three right now, share this screen. Um, the uh, first is Brown Girls Doc Mafia, the organization for women and non-binary people of color in the documentary field. They just released a Google Doc directory of their members who are available for work. So if you're looking for a producer, director, cinematographer, editor, check out their list. We will put up the links in uh, the chat window. Uh, the second organization is uh, Array Now, the independent film distribution and resource collective founded by Ava DuVernay. They just launched LEAP, the Law Enforcement Accountability Project that will fund story storytelling projects about the police. Uh, you can find them at leapaction.org. Uh, and then the third uh, thing I wanna highlight is the new show from Firelight Media, Beyond Resilience, we discussed it last week. It takes place every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, so just a couple hours from now. Uh, and we'll put the links up uh, in the chat window. Uh, note for that Beyond Resilience, if you wanna join it at four today, the RSVP list closes at 3.30, so make sure you act fast uh, on that one. Um, now, I'm going to uh, bring in our first guest, uh, Lacey Schwartz Delgado. I'll uh, ask her to, uh, bring... hello, Lacey. Hi, so great to be here. Um, so let me just say a few things about uh, Lacey's uh, background. Her, uh, her feature documentary debut is called Little White Lie. It's a personal story. As she documents in that film, she grew up in a Jewish family in Woodstock, New York. And she always looked a little bit different from the rest of her family. And it wasn't until she was 18 that she learned that her mother had had an affair with a black man who is Lacey's biological father. Uh, Little White Lie is a story about finding the truth and learning to reconcile. Um, her more recent project is called The Loving Generation. It's a series of shorts uh, from Topic about children born to one black parent, and one white parent. Uh, in the aftermath of the 1967 Supreme Court decision, Loving versus Virginia, that was the decision that overturned laws banning interracial marriage. Now Lacey has several new film and TV projects in the works. Um, her husband is Antonio Delgado. He's a US Congressman representing New York District 19 in upstate New York since 2018. He's a black politician serving a high percentage of white constituents. So Lacey has many different layers of experience uh, navigating tricky conversations about race. Um, Lacey's joining us now from uh, New York 19, am I right? <laughs> yes, Rhinebeck, New York. <laughs> Rhinebeck, New York. Um, so Lacey, these past two weeks, there's a new national reckoning. I, you know, I want to keep my enthusiasm in check because we know from U.S. history that we move forward, we move backward. But I don't think that we should hold back in giving credit to the Black Lives Matter movement for a lot of accomplishments. Right now, city councils are voting on police reduction. Broadcasters are canceling cop shows. Confederate monuments are coming down. And we're seeing racial bias being called out in all kinds of institutions. So I want to ask you, you know, what stands out to you about this moment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been it's been a 
been phases. I mean, it feels, you know, there was that first moment where the video came out and I think many of us who have lived through these moments and felt them incredibly deeply and it came out and it was painful, but there was, you know, it was kind of like, oh, this continues to happen. And then you started seeing some energy around it and it felt like skepticism. And honestly, on a personal level, it started being a lot of incoming messages. And then I think it switched to a moment of thinking, wait, can we actually be hopeful? And I think some of our, what I consider to be some of our current great thinkers started coming out in moments, you know, seeing John, image of John Lewis standing on, you know, Black Lives Matter street or whatever it actually is, was an incredible moment, you know, to see the connection between some of these historical moments and what's happening right now. I was personally pretty blown away seeing Mitt Romney on camera saying Black Lives Matter, just kind of bringing these words into the mainstream. Also some of the moments around uh, corporations um, stepping forward and not just not just saying we care about you know diversity, but actually saying Black Lives Matter and then putting dollars behind it. It's not the whole solution, but it certainly felt a bit different in those moments. So um, you know, there's all kinds of d new conversations happening that are overdue. You know, these conversations are taking place in the workplace. They're taking place among friends uh, in schools. You've worked a lot holding these kinds of conversations as, as you've been out on the speaking circuits talking about Little White Lie. What, what advice do you have for people who are having those tough conversations trying to bridge that gap? I mean, I think one of the main things, and I, I think we're seeing it, and it's, it's awkward. I mean, literally before I got on, the, on this, I was just on the phone with a friend who was talking, you know, we're all going through the awkwardness of it, is that so many of us in this country grow up with a race with which is front and center in, in our experience, in our identity, in our day-to-day -day reality, in our cultural existence. And then lots and lots, almost the vast majority grew up without any race. And there's always been to me this really, and, and seeing that go down, I mean, that was how I grew up. Right? I grew up in a white space, but we didn't call it a white space, right? It was just kind of neutralized. And so this idea of the fact that some people have a racialized identity while other people do not have a racialized identity, I think is something we always have to remember. And we have to be able to take a step back and understand that there is a huge step of accountability within that. You know, and also, I mean, I think we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but also who, you know, you put that burden on to take those steps forward of accountability. Because, you know, for black people in this country, they have been living this every single day of their life, all the time. And so to all of a sudden have this be this moment where, and I mean, you've heard it in moments before, but it, one of the things I will say, and I am a little bit hopeful, is even the recognition of the fact that black people alone cannot do the work that they are not the only people to be the educators, that there is an accountability I think is incredibly important. So, I mean, you talked about the awkwardness of these uh, conversations. Um, you know, it's hard to confront bias in your own life and to make mistakes. And, you know, you don't want to say something to a good friend that you're going to regret or feel stupid. Um, so, you know, what have you learned about having those kinds of conversations and, and challenging people you know, in a way that they're going to listen. I mean, you know, people are going to have to have conversations with their own family members or people in their workplace. You know, I think first of all, I mean, I feel like I don't have to tell this to a lot of people of color, in particular black people, but it is such an important reminder that self-care really, really matters, you know? So actually like sometimes setting those boundaries of what does it look like, what you can do the work, especially as I think filmmakers, and so many of us tuning in are filmmakers who would go out and we have these conversations, but then we can feel very bombarded at home. And so I think it, it becomes this um, like double conscious, double experience as always to be going through kind of like, how do I take care of myself and also do the work? And I think for, and so knowing when to also push back and say, you know, I had an organization that I grew up in reach out to me this week and say, you know, we'd love for you to be on a panel to talk about your experience. And I said, you know, do you think that the, what is the goals? And do you think that people turn, tuning in are at a moment of accountability yet? And she said, no, well, they have to learn first. And I said, well, you know what? Show me that they're willing to learn. Like have them read some books, have them watch some movies and then call me in two months. And I will show up and I will have this conversation with them. But part of it, I think in this moment, and it's really, really important that everybody sh is accountable to what they haven't done and doesn't necessarily ask everybody for the help. That actually, if you don't know the 101, um, 
then you should do the work yourself. It almost reminds me, honestly, of when I was first doing my first independent film and raising money for it. And you sit down, you have these meetings with people and they'll say, you know, the most basic places you can go and raise money. And as you educate yourself, you get more and more familiar. People, if you haven't done that already, people have to do that. And I think for me, it's being able to, without getting angry at each person or organization, say, please go do the work and then call me in two months and show me the commitment. Show me what you've done. Um, show me that you're still in this and that you have a long-term plan around it. Um, that is a great perspective. Um, I mean, for people who are listening to that and you know, asking themselves, okay, well, you know, what is the work that I should be doing? Are there any resources that stand out to you? I mean, obviously, it's incredible films and, and books. I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, James Baldwin's obviously been around a long time, but I'm Not Your Negro, I think, did an amazing job of kind of putting forward and really kind of describing some of those two worlds. I mean, I love ta Coates Between the Worlds and Me because I think he does really beautifully dis describe kind of living in the struggle and also this idea of... Um, of I'm blanking on how he describes it, but kind of being like innocent and being, you know, I can't remember how he describes how I feel right now, but the those kind of two worlds of blackness and whiteness that for me is growing up in a white community with honestly a white identity, I really understood it. I really connected to it. And I think that understanding how that can even go down, how that people who are on the right side of an argument, you know, I will never forget in 2016 around Charlottesville, um, one of the most impactful articles I read was from a black farmer living in Charlottesville who said, you know, the people who are carrying the torches and defending this, this statue, like those are not the people that I'm scared of. The people I'm scared of are wearing Lululemon yoga pants and I'm with her buttons. And I think sometimes the ways in which, especially in these last few years, we've looked at these issues sometimes as very binary when we really have to push past and be in accountability to a place of accountability, as I said before. I mean, so often uh, we deal with these issues like race. And um, my business partner, uh, Marat and I always talk about this in terms of like this idea of the big A advocacy, you know, these big issues top down, how it functions as society is how we talk about race. But so often, so many of us are living with race in what we call little A advocacy spaces, like these really personal, intimate spaces of family. And that's how we're actually experiencing a lot of times. It's not just, I mean, as you uh, noted in the introduction, there has been incredible institutional change, but we do have to do these quiet space change, this real accountability in those spaces and be honest with ourselves about where some of the fear has come from and how we've allowed it to perpetuate and live on within our lives, within our families and where that came from and how do we change that. You know, so many people uh, two weeks ago were, were asking for resources. How do you talk to kids about race? You know, that I was seeing that everywhere. How do you talk to kids about race? And so many of those people are not living the life that they would, I think, things say they would believe in, in terms of equality and equity and racial integration. You know, part of it, it's a moment to look at, if you have a barbecue and you don't invite any black people at all, you don't have any black friends, you don't have any, you're not close to any of your black colleagues. I think it's a moment not just to call the one or two black people, but to also say, I recognize that I have to change this and I'm going to do the work. And so I do think that there's some of those like one one I mean, I mean, a lot of people are reading White Fragility right now, How to Be an Anti-Racist. There's some of these um, incredible books that have come out in the last few years. And so I do think, though, that is a bookkeeping you have to almost do about your own personal life and how does it play out? Who are your kids going to school with? Who are you socializing with? Who are you hiring to work at your companies? Those are quiet conversations you have to have with yourself. Um, you talk about interfamily uh, conversations and you, you did this project, uh, The Loving Generation, uh, you know, profiling uh, people of, of mixed marriages. Um, uh, what have you learned about you know, the conversations that take place within those families? Those are families that came together because two people fell in love, but you know, often the in-laws are you know, on different sets of, uh, of, of perspectives. And, and I'm sure that the, the conversations there must uh, offer a lot that we could all learn from. Yeah, absolutely. And just to be clear, it wasn't even sometimes, you know, the in-laws, sometimes it was even within their actual parents who hadn't actually had the conversation. I mean, I, this project, which in a lot of ways I felt like we did with um, Topic and particularly with Anna Holmes, whose idea it was, was 
was so incredible to me because it was kind of a follow-up for me of Little White Lie, of looking at people with one Black, one white parent who had grown up after the civil rights movement, but before you could check more than one box in the census. In a lot of ways, growing up on the color line, and many of the people that we included are some of what I, you know, some of the great journalists of our times, including, who fit into this generation, including Nicole Hannah-Jones, Adam Sewer, Melissa Harris-Perry, Soledad O'Brien, and being able to, and Elaine Walter Roth, many other people are involved in it, um, being able to really reflect on growing up sometimes between two worlds. Who, even within your parents, were your parents able to have this conversation with you about being honest about, or were they sometimes more idealistic coming out of it? And how were you able to identify and what was your fear of that? And I think that that was for us, we really wanted to look at, you know, how that firsthand experience, and some of these people were so incredible because they both had that firsthand experience, but they also understood the historical context and were able to analyze it as such. Um, we have a few more minutes left with Lacey. If people have questions, uh, please put them into the Q&A button uh, below. Um, I want to ask you about our own field of uh, documentary. Uh, you know, last week uh, I saw a lot of talks um, where uh, uh, people in the documentary community are, you know, pointing out um, long-held bias in 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 this community. Um, we did a uh, Monday memo video uh, that we'll put a link up to that uh, that captures some of those um, key sound bites. But there's a lot more that we could have chosen from uh, there. Um, I wonder, you know, as someone who's in the documentary space, you know, what stands out to you as work that, that needs to be done? I mean, you know, the conversation that we've started in the last few years starting to see, but who tells what stories and what stories are made? And I think in particular, you know, with race, even when honestly, and, you know, a Little White Lie came out in, um, we had our New York premiere at Doc NYC, and it was amazing and a great conversation, but it was really interesting with um, film programmers before that, in terms of like, can we have, a, you know, my film is mainly about talking about race with white people. You know, it's like a film with 90% white people in it. And it almost like felt like it didn't fit into the conversation um, about um, what race is, which is a lot of times focused on like criminalization and the poverty and things like that, where a lot of us are, are experiencing it in many different ways. And so I think this idea of that, you know, whose stories are we telling and how are we supporting them is a huge issue. And I don't, you know, I think we've all seen examples of that, but do we, and, you know, I watched your, you know, when Marsha Smith made that statement about like the fact that, you know, right now this moment of like a double pandemic for the black community and that the films that are being made are all 15 that are currently kind of racing to be the top one are all being made by white filmmakers. You know, are you going to be able to understand what that really feels like to live with that day in, day out, the health disparities that already existed within the Black community before this happened and have only um, exceeded? I mean, we're working on a project right now that is a scripted version of that, but not with COVID necessarily, but just really being able to talk, let people talk from their own experience and understand that more than anyone else. Um, so before I let you go, I just I want to ask you have a frontline seat on the politics of this uh, with your husband Antonio as, as a congressman. You know, what do you witness in the political landscape um, around this moment? You know, one of the things that I think, and I, I wanted to say this earlier actually, that is so incredible to me about this moment is it really feels like everybody's getting in their lane. You know, I just listened this morning. I don't know if anybody listened to the Dave Chappelle performance that he just put out. And, you know, he says at one point that, like, thank you and I believe in you to the young people on the front lines planning these protests, at these protests. And I just think that one of the things I feel so hopeful about is the fact that we are all in our lanes. You know, I mean, for me, uh, when we, Antonio and I changed our lives in many ways for him to run for office in 2018, and I had not never been traditionally involved in the political space. And I felt like it was really important that people like myself who were considering themselves impact storytellers get involved to say, you know, if I look at 2016, what was the problem? I didn't do enough. And I think just like in this moment, that was a huge moment of accountability for me. And so now to see in, you know, the, his class and his colleagues in, in this, for, this class, 
in the house that came in in 2018 are incredible. They're the most diverse by race, by ethnicity, by gender, by age, um, by religion that we've ever seen before. And so to see, you know, kind of that class getting in its lane to, all, but at the same time, for those of us as storytellers, you know, I am very involved, Shalini and Ursula are as well with Firelight Media, which you featured in a few ways earlier. And just what we've been able to do, I think it's a collective of storytellers. It's incredible to come together with your colleagues, with your team and get in your lane, whether or not you're in a corporate space or a storytelling space or a political space. And so that's been really, really exciting for me to also, I do have obviously a window into this political space. And I think it's, you know, as my husband said on a, uh, some press thing the other day, you know, that people like him are there to do the will of the people, you know, and that I think what you're seeing in DC is that people are stepping forward because of the will of the people and that, you know, the activists are pushing the legislators, et cetera, et cetera. And we're, and the storytellers are bringing things to the forefront. And so I find that incredibly encouraging that we can all work together. Uh, Lacey, thank you so much for taking the time uh, with us today. I know that you've got a lot of uh, people calling upon you. So it, it really means a lot to me personally. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to let uh, Lacey go, and I'm going to bring up our next guest. She brought herself up, Ursula Liang. Um, so uh, Ursula has been a longtime friend of uh, Doc NYC. She's uh, someone that I call upon a lot for advice. She has an eclectic list of producing credits from ESPN to the New York Times. She directed the documentary Nine Man about a Chinese-American streetball game. And her latest film is Down a Dark Stairwell. It looks at a case from 2014 when a police officer, Peter Liang, no relation uh, to Ursula, uh, despite the same last name, uh, that police officer shot and killed an unarmed man named Akai Gurley in the stairwell of a New York City housing project. The victim was African-American. The police officer was Chinese-American. Um, and the officer was brought to trial and caused coalitions to form on either side of the case. Down a Dark Stairwell had its premiere at the True Falls Film Festival in early March, one of the last festivals to take place in person. It's now playing at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival online. Uh, Human Rights Watch Film Festival got underway yesterday in all 11 Films in its lineup are available online across the United States with the purchase of a ticket that are available in limited quantities. Um, but each film also has a live Q&A, and those Q&As are being recorded and can be watched for free anywhere in the world. Ursula's live Q&A is going to take place on Wednesday, June 17th, but you can watch the film, uh, excuse me, before then, and we'll put a link in the chat box for more information. So, uh, Ursula, can you you know, explain what drew you to, to the story of, of Peter Liang and, and Akai Gurley. Well, this incident actually happened just shortly after the Eric Garner case, um, where there was no justice and there was a lot of movement in the Black Lives Matter um, uh, movement at that time. And, it, it, and when this happened and I saw that the uh, police officer was Asian American, I saw this as an opportunity to bring the Asian American community into the conversation. Um, sometimes our community is not always following mainstream news. Um, a lot of people who are here speaking other languages follow Chinese language news. And, and I think um, the movement hadn't quite reached that community. I felt like it was an important um, access point. So, I mean, this story is not a, a black and white story by uh, any means. Uh, you know, we, we've seen some stories around police violence where it feels a little bit more cut and dried, you know, where um, uh, where there's a, a serious injustice and there's, you know, a group defending the injustice and a group opposed to it. This is a little bit more of a complicated story, or, or maybe it's not to you, but I mean, it seems more complicated that you're dealing with two groups that have been historically disenfranchised in this country, Asian Americans and African Americans. Um, and you know, and these different coalitions uh, uh, form, you know, can you talk about, you know, what you recognized about the complexity of the story as you got into it? I was definitely attracted to the complexity of it and it made the film hard to make. But um, 
yeah, it's definitely a much more complex um, point of view. And we were really interested in making the film in a way that um, really elevated the Black and Asian community voices. So we actually, in the film, don't interview anyone but Black and Asian people for the film. And um, so there was a very conscious, there was a lot of consciousness in, the, in how we made it. So our, our, creative, our creative team is also Black and Asian. And, um, you know, it's, it's complicated because we don't often talk to one another. You know, in America, race is seen as very, in a very binary way. It's always talked about in black and white. And other groups oftentimes feel like they're left out of the conversation. But that doesn't mean that all of these systems of oppression don't also affect them. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talk around the world word model minority when you talk about the Asian American community. And it's a term that was really created to divide communities, um, to really separate um, Asian Americans from other minority groups and uh, and make it look like there was no systemic oppression. When in reality, Asian Americans have the highest poverty rates in New York City. Our community is very diverse. Um, it, I think the Asian Americans sometimes like this model minority narrative because it, we have so few representations of ourselves on screen that having like a positive representation feels, um, feels like the good thing if you only have one. Um, but the reality is very different. And we have so many, we have such a blend of communities that fall under the umbrella of Asian Americans. So there's, there's no distinction. And we're being lumped in this group that's then being used as a wedge against other minority groups. And ultimately that serves white supremacy and keeping up the systems of oppression. So what we see in Down and Dark Stairwell is there are uh, Asian activists who align themselves with the African-American protesters seeking justice uh, in the case of, of Akai Gurley. Um, can you talk to me about like you, you know, what you witnessed of, of those Asian American activists who are trying to form alliances and you know, maybe what we can all learn about that uh, bridge building? Well, the reality is that those Asian Americans um, were, have been doing this work for a long time. This incident wasn't the incident that brought them into Black Lives Matter movement. They've been forming solidarity movements over generations. And so um, I would say that there's, you know, you have to sort of look at what the Asian American community is to sort of understand all the nuances of this film, which hopefully will be unpacked in some educational discussions around the film. But there are many different um, sort of immigration movements here. And so there are folks that have been in America for, you know, for five generations. And those types of Asian Americans tend to have a much better understanding of the civil rights movement. They tend to have more um, cross-racial friendships. They tend to have more um, solidarity building moments with other groups. And so a lot of the activists that supported the Akai Gurley movement from the Asian community are in that camp. And, and by and large, the Asian American community in America is very progressive. You know, I think our, our voting rates are largely progressive, most oppose affirmative action and these other sort of wedge issues. Um, and it was really interesting to see um, how specifically they knew that their role was important on this case. I mean, they were always sort of, this Asian Americans for Black Lives sort of movement has always been present and has always been very active in allyship. But to see their role sort of be elevated as we have a responsibility to speak to our own people, they took it very seriously. And, you know, there are moments where people are, you know, Black Lives Matter has been translated into Chinese and you'll see people uh, protesting in Chinatown saying thing, you know, speaking in language to the newer immigrants who don't understand the history. So it's it's been a burden on that community to help explain to the newer immigrant community or the more conservative viewing um, communities in the Asian American world um, why this movement is important and why it's why it's important to us, not just others. Um, as you've been watching the protests of the last couple of weeks, um, I wonder what you think your film, you know, adds to that discussion or, or, you know, what we can take away from your film that applies to what's happening today. Well, I mean, I don't know how many people are looking at sort of this interracial um, solidarity stuff. And I, I think that, you know, the film took a long time to make and we were making it in the wake of a lot of other Black Lives Matter films. And so there was sort of this the strategic problem of people feeling like they had protest fatigue and Black Lives Matter film uh, fatigue. And we always thought that we had a new story. We thought we had like a forward looking story that really was talking about systemic oppression and was talking about how our communities are going to be continually lose, used against each other um, in not just this issue, but other issues. So it, it, to me, it seems like we're, you know, I, I want the film, you know, I think want people to look at the film and look at ideas of like cultural nationalism too, you know, how people tend to, um, live in sort of isolated spaces and group ideologically with the people that look like them and whether that's right. I mean, we see that even in the rise of like white supremacy when, when the, we were still in the middle of making this film, 
Black Lives Matter movement had died down a little bit, but we had that Charlottesville moment where people are walking with cheeky torches, I realized that's sort of the same kind of thing. I mean, this is a group of white people who are banding together because they're white, and this white nationalism is not, I don't want to say it's the same, but, but we have these tendencies to group and group think about things, and I think it's important to really think specifically about cases, specifically about issues, and not... Um, and question whether we need to align ourselves with people that look like us, even if the even if the ideas aren't right. I asked Lacey a question about uh, the documentary fields and you know and the reckoning that's going on in our own field about uh, blind spots, shortcomings, you know, ways that this field uh, ought to do better. Um, I wonder what are things that uh, stand out to you. The documentary world. I mean, there could be a long list of things that we could go through, but I think, I think, um, I don't know, Tom. I mean, from a festival standpoint, since you work in sort of the festival space, I do, um, I think I wanted to highlight one of the things that Lacey said about like what stories, who's making the stories and what stories are being made. I think to me, what stories are being made are almost more important because um, there's, you know, I think when you have a, like a legacy of programming teams that are not as diverse, I'm not saying this about Doc NYC, but I think there is a legacy across the country of critics and um, programming teams that are not as diverse. They don't see the same story that a different person from a different cultural group might see. And so I've always felt like my idea for, for sort of more of the mainstream festivals would be to like highlight some of the things that are coming out of the community festivals to have like a rather than like a best of fest that pulls things out of Sundance and, uh, you know, uh, Toronto to have like sort of a best of fest of like the, the, the community festivals, like the Asian American community, uh, community festival is really robust and we care about very specific things within our community. So I think to help build audiences for festivals, you're going to need to bring our audiences in and commit to, to commit to them and showing some of the work that we think is important, which might not necessarily think, um, be the same as what you think is important, um, you as a, as a whole. Um, I think that could be a way to help solve some some of the inequity in stories that are being told and shown. You know, when you talk about storytelling, there's also a question about a question about what kind of stories get told is a question about the complexity of stories. And you know, we see a lot of hero narratives uh, mm -hmm. in the documentary space, or you know, kind of clear pathways justice. You know, something about down a dark stairwell is that it's you know it's murky it's uh, it's yeah. complex and you know and i wonder if you can you know talk about the challenges maybe that you've uh, faced getting that kind of story made yeah that it's it's the story i like to tell even my past film nine man it was a you know a chorus of characters and a lot of layers and those are the stories i'm attracted to and it's funny because i had a friend who's a critic watch my film and he was like oh that film looks like you. It's like the craziness in my head sort of on screen and that's not for everybody to watch. I think it's much easier to sell a, a single character, um, very specifically driven narrative. Um, and I think the hard part in getting in, in putting a film like mine out into the world is sort of getting people on board early. Um, it's the kind of film sometimes when you have complicated stuff that has to be seen when it's done for people to like come on board and support. So it becomes really hard to get like earlier funding and to get people to buy in if they don't know you as a filmmaker and know your work. I was lucky enough to have a partnership fairly early on with ITVS and the, the public television system, but I believe my like entry point to that was that I had um, somebody on that team who had moved to that office that had seen my previous work and, and like sort of understood who I was as a filmmaker and what, um, what it would take to support me and get me there. So it took a little bit more faith on their part, but they had like, they knew me. So, I mean, I think in the case of you know, filmmakers of color, especially emerging ones, they're not gonna have that kind of um, support built in. And so I think we have to think about like the complexity of stories and how much more interesting things can be. You know, if you have a complex story, you can watch it four times and still get something new out of it every time. There are simple stories you can watch and you can make a theater clap at the end, but the, the complex ones are the ones that have longevity. And if you're talking about numbers, because everyone wants to make money, if someone's gonna watch that film 10 times and it's gonna be used in classroom for 20 years, Consider the value of that compared to the value of a uh, you know a solo story where you know what's going to happen and once you find out what happens you don't watch it again. So I don't know. Um, you're an active member of uh, 
groups like ADOCS that uh, uh, support Asian American documentary and Brown Girls Doc Mafia that I mentioned earlier and your Firelight Media Fellow. Um, can you talk about what those organizations have meant to your career? Uh, a lot. I mean, it's sort of like, this is maybe a feeling you guys can't totally understand if you're not a person of color feeling marginalized in a lot of way in your life. Because when you get into some of those spaces, you just feel a sense of comfort. So there's something that just happens to your physical body and mind that makes you feel a little bit more at ease. And so just being around some of those folks, like feeling like they understand me um, is very important. I mean, Firelight has been amazing. They've, you know, they supported me financially. Um, ADOC and Brown Girl Stock Mafia have also contributed to like sending me places to, to do networking. And um, I don't know, those communities are different spaces and we feel like we can have like real talk within those spaces, which is very freeing. Um, you are living in the Bronx. Uh, there's protests going on right now. There are um, a lot of people in the filmmaking community out there trying to cover that. Uh, you know, I wonder what you're seeing and what you're thinking about in, you know, in the films that are maybe going to get made about this moment. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, with COVID and with the protests that are happening, I feel like those are the sexy stories that the whole industry flocks to. Um, and and you need to think about the long tail of the story, what the complexity of it is. I mean, I don't think you're going to get an interesting film out of either one of those topics without really thinking um, about a complex story and how it uh, progresses the conversation three years from now. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know if I'm seeing a lot of people filming out here. I'm seeing a lot of people amplifying and that's sort of what I feel my role is, is to amplify the movement. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I also see a lot, of, a lot of talk amongst white allies about giving stories to people of color, which I really appreciate, but also know that this is a moment where especially black folks are really like in a lot of, uh, in a, like a traumatized space. So it's like the bandwidth for doing, for having a black uh, director go out and do a, do a protest documentary right now is like, it's a different ask in some ways because you're asking a person that's already dealing with a lot emotionally and, practically. And so I would hope that some of these people who are thinking about ways in which they can diversify their workforces, think about long-term stuff um, and think about rather than, you know, plucking a black person to do a story about a black protest movement, but thinking about offering that person an opportunity to pitch the story they really want to tell and when they want to tell it. Um, because this whole movement is, is like sort of part of the, the body of a, a a black person in America, it's going to, it will be present in whatever film they make um, about a different topic. So, uh, you know, it's a lot going on and a lot to do right now. Uh, so Down a Dark Stairwell, it's uh, plain, people can watch it now at, at Human Rights Watch uh, Film Festival online. They can get the ticket and watch it at any time from now till June 20th. Um, on Wednesday, June 17th, you're gonna be doing a, uh, a live conversation, which people can watch anywhere in the world um, for free, separate from the film. Um, can you talk about who's gonna be in that conversation? Oh, I don't know if all the panelists are confirmed yet. So okay, well, that, I, I don't think I can. It's gonna be me and uh, a program officer from Human Rights Watch, and then I'm not sure if everyone else is confirmed, but uh, if you are listening and you were a person that asked, was asked to be on the panel, please respond by email and let's get that locked in and then I'll announce it. If anyone wants to follow me online, I will announce that all very shortly. And, uh, and then remind us the next steps of where your film goes from here. Um, we are still in negotiation. Um, it will have a television premiere next year. Um, we're considering a lot of fall festivals, but I think the fall festivals are still considering what they're doing. So a uh, lot's up in the air at this point. All right. Well, uh, I guess for listeners, now is a great time to take advantage, uh, to, to see Down a Dark, dark Stairwell as long as it's playing uh, Human Rights Watch. I know that there'll be other uh, opportunities to, to see it uh, ahead. So, oh. Ursula, I really appreciate you taking time. I appreciate uh, you know everything you do for me when you take my calls and give me uh, advice. Um, so, thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. All right, I'm gonna let you go, Ursula, and I'm gonna bring in uh, Shalini Kantaya, our uh, last guest. There's Shalini joining us from uh, Brooklyn. 
Um, so uh, Shalini's film is uh, also uh, playing at Human Rights Watch, um, but uh, and that film is called Coded Bias. Um, uh, it had its world premiere at Sundance Film Festival in 2020. So Shalini is one of the lucky filmmakers in 2020 that actually got to have an in-person on the big screen um, experience. Uh, her resume includes stints as a Fulbright scholar and a TED fellow. She previously directed Catching the Sun about uh, clean energy. Um, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show, before I uh, talk more, um, I'm gonna show the trailer to your film. And it's gonna take me a second to get it up. Uh, what do I want to um, do? do, do. Uh, hang on. There it is. Okay, let me. Oh, gotta press share. You get to see all the behind the scenes uh, action. All right, let's watch this. During my first semester at MIT, I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology. Our ideas about technology that we think are normal are actually ideas that come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Vast amounts of data at incredible speed. Everybody has unconscious biases, and people embed their own biases into technology. This kid got stopped as a result of facial recognition misidentification. And then use that as justification to search you. This is an innocent child. Racism is becoming mechanized. Systemic issues are only going to be hardwired into new technologies. It's not just face classification, it's any data centric technology. Every day we are all being scored. Who gets hired? Who gets housing? I am making predictions for your life right now. The people who own the code deploy it on other people, and there is no accountability. Management at Atlantic Towns wanted to install the facial recognition software. Pretty much turned its place into Fort Knox. The technology is being rapidly adopted and there are no safeguards. We are socially controlled in a way that we don't see. Technology that analyzes faces could be biased, but the company is pushing it anyway. What demographic is it most effective on? White men. Show me that it's going to be fair, that it's legal, before you put it out. That's what we don't have yet. It's going to take people coming together, driving for justice in this age of automation. All right, let me back to uh, screen. Um, uh, so, uh, Shalini, uh, your film is also playing at Human Rights Watch Film Festival, like I said, and it, uh, people can watch it anytime from now till June 20th, but your live Q&A is tonight, so if people want to uh, tune in um, later on, they can uh, check out the link uh, in our window. Um, wh what got you on this story, and, and when did you start following this story? I feel like all of my work in some way has to do with how disruptive technologies make the world less fair or more fair, um, sort of issues around equality and technology. And I think most of my films have to do with how they how technology impacts race, class, and gender. And so as a TED fellow, I sort of um, got introduced to the talks of women that are now in my film, Joy Book, Bolamwini, uh, Kathy O'Neill, and Zainab Tufekci, and sort of stumbled down the rabbit hole and sort of became fascinated with this dark underbelly of big technology. 
And that set me on the journey to make coding bias. And so a lot of the story was kind of unfolding, it seems, as you were uh, uh, following it. You, um, you know, you see some of those women that you just mentioned coming together, meeting, I think, for the first time, finding alliances. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what you started with and what you saw develop as it went along. Um, well, I think it always starts with a character. I mean, documentaries start with characters. And I thought um, Joy Bolomini is an extraordinary character. Um, this sort of young woman who is basically just trying to make an art project work at MIT Media Lab and is trying to get the camera to recognize her face and sort of stumbles upon one of the largest civil rights kind of issues of our time, which is addressing racial and gender bias in algorithms. And so while the film sort of um, centers facial recognition technology, because in some ways it's sort of the easiest and most cerebral for everyone to understand, it also explores how algorithms have become these sort of automated gatekeepers, um, algorithms that have not been vetted for accuracy or racial or gender bias are often you know, making decisions about who gets hired, who gets fired, who gets healthcare, in, um, who, who gets a good quality of healthcare, and sort of even who, um, how long a prison sentence someone may serve. And so what is so dangerous about this, I found for civil rights and democracy is a lot of times we don't even know where there's been an algorithmic decision maker in the process. Sometimes we don't even know we've been denied admission in that first um, sort of pass from colleges and universities based on a decision made by an AI. And so, uh, you know, quite along with Joy and in seeing her testify before Congress, um, I sort of came to see this as one of the, this is actually where the battle for civil rights and democracy will be fought in the 21st century. So if this is sounding abstract to people, I wonder if I can ask you about a specific example you give in the film uh, about when Amazon was using AI to uh, sort through its resumes to decide who it should hire. Uh, and I guess these were for tech jobs, right? As opposed to like uh, packing jobs in a warehouse. Exactly, exactly. And so uh, basically, you know, Amazon wasn't trying to be discriminatory, quite the contrary. They were saying, let's make an AI, and AI doesn't have human biases. Um, but what I came to understand in the making of the film is these algorithms are all based on data. So what is it looking at? Who was promoted in the past? Who uh, you know, retained their job over a series of years? And on you know, our sort of um, unconscious bias, gets embedded in the data and the AI sort of picks up on that. So an algorithm that Amazon created to be less biased ended up discriminating against any woman who had a woman's college on her resume, had a woman's sport on her resume. And so it became this sort of glaring example. Because the computer had looked at the data of Amazon and says, oh, it looks like this company prefers to hire white men. So as we sort through resumes, let's move them up the chain. Exactly. Exactly. It, and so what AI does, it sort of replicates the data of the past and with it, the past injustices. And so um, what Meredith Broussard says so well is that if we trust AI systems to make these important decisions, we're not actually going to have social progress. We're going to be replicating the sort of injustices of the past. Uh, Meredith Broussard, uh, she wrote a book called Artificial Unintelligence um, uh, and, and it's featured in your film. So uh, it strikes me that a lot of the main characters featured in your film are women, Meredith Broussard, uh, Joy Bolomwini, Kathy O'Neill. Um, they came together in a group called, they call themselves the Algorithmic Justice uh, League. Um, and, you know, I wonder what we should take away from the fact that these are, you know, women who are calling out this problem, 
uh, I mean, maybe in light of that Amazon um, anecdote, it seems obvious why, uh, you know, why women are putting their finger on this. Um, but I wonder when you see them speak up within existing power structures, uh, you know, do you find them being challenged and, and being hurt? I think the women in my film are profoundly, um, their groundbreaking research is the reason we can have this conversation. So they're both sort of the brainiest in terms of, I think there's seven PhDs in the film and they're all at the front, on the forefront of sort of technology and mathematics and know all the stuff. But at the same time, had this second identity as an outsider. They were women, they were people of color, they were queer. And so somehow along the way had an experience where an algorithm wasn't optimized for them. And they came to understand what this could mean, what the unintended consequences could mean for a marginalized community. And so um, the thing that I'm most proud of is, you know, there are three women in particular whose work I want to highlight today, and that's Joy Bolamwini, Tim Nick Gebru, and um, Deborah Raji, whose groundbreaking research is essentially the reason why we know facial recognition is racially biased, right? And uh, in the making of the film, you see, you know, Amazon trying to discredit, in essence, their research. And in the last, like, five days, that has totally been game-changed. IBM um, just on Monday announced that they will not offer, sell, or um, offer, develop, or sell this technology to police or law enforcement, facial recognition. Two days later, the unthinkable happened, and is that Amazon said that they would press pause on facial recognition technology and its sale to the police. And just for good measure, Microsoft jumped on the bandwagon yesterday. And so this is a change unheard of, and I feel like it shows the power of when there's inclusivity in the sciences and scientists have the bravery to speak out in spite of economic interest. And then that's coupled with civic engagement and the largest movement for civil rights and equality that we've seen in 50 years. And those two things together just pressured sort of big technology to put down big authoritarian tools. And so what I see is, um, I feel like sometimes I make documentaries to remind myself that a few people can make a big difference in the world. And we just saw it happen. And um, while it's a first step that we're all um, incredibly excited about, it's not enough. And what's exciting, I feel like, about this moment and about releasing this film in this moment is that the cement is sort of still wet on these technologies. It's sort of like in New York where the cement is wet and you can still tag your name in it. And I feel like we can still put our hand of democracy and sort of civil protections on these technologies before, before they're deployed at scale. So um, that's what I think is so exciting. And um, I just want to give kudos to the genius women in my film for their groundbreaking research. Well, one thing that strikes me is that you know, this kind of violation of civil rights that happens at the stage of algorithms, it's maybe harder to witness, harder to document. I mean, right now, you know, you, these uh, measures that you've just described, like Amazon, you know, putting pressing pause on sharing its face recognition technology with police forces. If they decide to press unpause on that at some time in the future, it's not something we might notice. You know, it's not something that is that's as visible as someone um, getting beat up by a police officer. Um, so, I mean, I wonder if you can talk about the you know the the trickiness of that you know invisibility of some of these things. Absolutely. I mean, this is Doc NYC. So we've seen in our communities what stop and frisk has meant for communities of color. And real time facial recognition has the capacity to be um, a high tech stop and frisk, basically. And so what the research of the scientists have shown is that this technology does not 
work well on, on communities of color, does not work well on women, does not work well on young faces, all of the communities that this technology has been targeted on. It's been targeted to the FBI, to ICE, to law enforcement. So um, I actually could not do this work. I, I could not uh, film this part of the documentary in the States because we don't have any laws governing this behavior. I actually had to go to Europe where there is some transparency. And one of the most, I think, terrifying things that we captured in the film um, was a 14-year-old black child in, um, in, you know, school uniform, suit school uniform, being stopped by five plainclothes police officers because of real-time facial recognition technology. So this is a case where in London, they've got a van with... Uh cameras set up on the street just w watching everyone who goes down the street and though and their facial recognition is matching those faces to a database I want a database that a lot of us don't know who's in that database what what is on that warranted database and so um, big brother watch uk uh they filed freedom of information reports and they found out that more than 90% of the people, over 2,000 people, had been wrongly misidentified, which has a massive sort of implication for communities of color. And this is data that we get. And so um, I feel like that's sort of what is most terrifying is um, coded bias tries to show sort of three different governmental approaches to, to this. Like you have China, which has this very authoritarian, unfettered access to everything, which is sort of like the Black Mirror episode inside of a documentary. And then you have the UK where they have some rights, but they have to protect them. And then you have the US, which is essentially a wild, wild west in these technologies, um, which I think is really dangerous because a lot of these technologies are being developed here at home. And so while it's, a great first step that big tech is putting down authoritarian technology and recognizing that this has real consequences for communities of color. Um, it's not enough. We actually need laws in place so that we hold them to democratic standards. Um, as I wrap up here, let me ask you about you know the effort towards laws. There's a woman in your film named Kathy O'Neill, she wrote a book called Weapons of Math uh, Destruction. Um, and uh, she, I, I quoted her, I, I featured this film on WNYC's documentary The Week today, and there's a quote from her where she's talking about comparing uh, algorithms to food and drugs regulation. And she says, you know, food and drugs has an FDA, uh, administration, we need a version of the FDA to uh, govern algorithms. Uh, I think I recall also a, a sequence of congressional testimony in your film where we, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was a Republican uh, representative who was responding, you know, pretty strongly in a, in a favorable way to, to listening to some of these activists. So it, it does feel like, you know, Maybe he's not representative, but the, this, there are tendrils to make this a bipartisan issue. Um, can, can you talk about more what's happening? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I saw something very exciting um, while filming Joy's testimony to, to Congress, which is that sometimes our government works and has productive dialogue. And for me, I think it was such a, a, a light went on for me to hear Jim Jordan, Republican from Ohio, almost was uh, the minority leader. And basically for him to say, wait a minute, 117 million Americans faces are in a police database and no one in an elected office said okay. And in no one in an elected office is giving oversight. And to see a Republican as terrified as the Democrats around these technologies was sort of, um, uh, a eureka moment, and I hope will be a push for some bipartisan support. Um, I mean, this technology makes the East German Stasi makes 
COINTELPRO operations, it makes them look like they all had a very light touch. <laughs> and so we should all be alarmed about the uses of these technologies in our democracies. Um, uh, so actually, I'm just noticing a question from Pamela Yates, and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. But she writes, um, uh, do you think that your film also played a role in Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft stepping back from using facial recognition, especially regarding being complicit uh, with the police? So, do, you, do you have uh, signed it? I mean, your film had a premiere at Sundance. It's had not a lot of exposure yet, but uh, do you, you know, feel um, like it's getting I, out there? I hope that the Sundance premiere of the film and the movement that we're building behind it played some role in this happening, but I don't want to take away, um, I think what the film does is shine a light that there is a movement inside of big tech that's been happening for years, and women and men who have been doing this sort of groundbreaking research for years, and I hope what the film does is sort of share that this is actually a movement for ethics, for comprehensive ethics in tech. Um, all right, so Shalini, your uh, Q&A is tonight. Who else is going to be joining you tonight? I'm going to be um, joined by some brilliant and badass women. Um, uh, MIT Media Lab researcher Joy Bolamwini, her research partner Deborah Raji, the most amazing, groundbreaking um, uh, author of Algorithms of Oppression, Sophia Amoja Noble, will be joining us as well as from right here in the great state of New York, the ACLU will, will be joining us to, to help us all take action on these issues locally. Mm -hmm. So I hope everyone can watch Coded Bias at the uh, Human Rights Watch Film Festival. It's available until the 20th and you can tune in that conversation live tonight or it'll be uh, available uh, later. Uh, Shalini, thank you very much for taking time out of your day um, on you know when you have a, another premiere uh, this evening. So um, thank you. I'll. I'll say goodbye to you now before I make my closing remarks. Um, all right, I want to uh, just give a couple highlights of things to come uh, at Doc NYC. Next week, we have another class on safe and secure production. Um, these classes take place over two days. You can watch them live or you can, uh, or you can watch them anytime uh, if you're enrolled. Um, so there's really great stuff there. I hope you get to tune in for some of that. Um, want to remind you to sign up for our Monday memo. It's a weekly, daily, uh, it's a weekly dose of, uh, of the week's documentary news. You can get it free as a newsletter delivered uh, to your inbox. And uh, we will be back uh, next week, uh, next Friday, with uh, more guests. We'll be announcing them on Monday. I want to thank our crew, Sarah Modo, Caitlin Boyle, Rafael Nehausen, and a big thanks to our guests, Lacey Schwartz Delgado, Ursula Liang, and Shalini Kantaya. Thanks very much for joining Friday Fix, and we will see you next week, I hope.